Hey everyone, this is George Kroos with a solo episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And even though that's a theme to Mindset Monday, I wanted to use that um, sound just because it's my favorite and I uh, didn't want to do the, the typical Innovators Mindset um, podcast music. And uh, I'll tell you this right now, uh, this is actually the last podcast I'm recording in this room. I've actually thought about eight times this is the last, but this is legitimately the last podcast I'm recording in this room. Uh, if you've been following me, uh, you know that um, we've recently moved uh, to a new country and uh, we moved to Orlando and uh, pretty excited about it. So uh, I, I typically what I've always done is I record a bunch of these episodes ahead of time so I can schedule them. So there's a consistency when you know uh, they're coming out. So it's kind of like a bittersweet moment. This is my last time. I love just kind of sitting uh, you know, looking at this camera, recording this podcast, and uh, pretty soon you'll see me in a new location. Who knows what the background's going to look like? I got to figure that stuff out. Lots of things up in the air right now, but I'm excited to talk to you. And uh, what I wanted to do today is something I actually do the opposite way. Typically, um, I'm actually I just kind of think about sometimes I write blog posts. I'll write some notes down. Uh, and then I'll write a blog post and eventually I'll make them into a podcast after I really kind of flesh them out uh, in my mind. But I'm going to actually flip it this time. So I did write a couple of notes down, but instead of like publishing those po blog posts, which I will eventually, uh, I just wanted to kind of work it out in front of you all. And, you know, if you're listening, watching on YouTube, whatever, um, there's a couple of things I've been really thinking about lately. And they kind of seem like there's an intersection between the two of them. And even though there'll probably be separate blog posts, I wanted to think about the connection and, you know, give you some time uh, out of your day to kind of uh, listen and think about this. And uh, the first thing is uh, the the 10-year plans that I hear about in education. And I've, you know, probably been a part of in some way um, in, in some of my work. And I will tell you, I'm not a fan. Like, oh, like, you know, it's 2022. Like, what are we, what's school going to look like in 2032, right? And we do this and, you know, we plan. And I think a lot of times this is the dirty little secret in education it's more of a PR thing. Like, do we actually, um, a lot of times the superintendents that made those plans are gone, right? And did we actually like follow up like, hey, in 2022, in 2012, we said this is gonna what 2022 is gonna look like. Did we actually go back and look? Did we actually go and say like, hey, do we, is any of that true? Did we go through it? Are we maybe above it? Are we past it? Did things uh, change significantly? You know, do we actually go revisit those things? Or there's something that we wanna, you know, kind of come off to our communities as these, really forward thinking school communities. And the thing that I've always said, there's a couple of things that I say that are really important to me that the, the thing that I don't know what five, 10 years is going to look like from now, neither do you, no one does. Right. Well, and, unless you're, I don't know, unless you control billions of dollars that maybe you are uh, whatever, I don't want to get into those theories, but I think a lot of times we plan this. And I think the most important thing is that we don't know what's going to you know, happen, but what we do need to really focus on is that we teach our kids and ourselves to be able to adapt to whatever comes our way. That I always know this. And I think, you know, being comfortable with technology, technology always changes. Like right now I'm using, you know, a tool to adapt and that tool could just change without my permission, without my interaction. And all of a sudden I got to figure out how it works. I can't say, well, they've updated it. Now I, now I can't use it anymore. I got to figure it out. And I think that's a mindset. Whereas, you know, I think, in the past, um, where we've become so comfortable with things, other people, when things change, they're like, okay, well, I guess I'm out. And I think as long as you're willing to grow and adapt and we can implement that into our, to the minds of the, the kids that we work with and ourselves, then we'll always be fine five, 10, 15 years from now, as long as you're willing to learn and grow. And that's something that we develop in our students and ourselves we will always be fine. But the other reason I really struggle with the 10 year plan is the kids today um, don't care about your 10-year plan. They don't care. They just care about what's happening right now in the classroom. And just think about that, that you are, it's like saying, hey, we, it's like, don't you get frustrated about this? This is why I talk this stuff out is because this just came to my mind. Like you're with a company forever and they're like, hey, new customers, guess what you're going to get if you sign up? They're like, hey, I've been with you for 10 years. Like, what about me? Like, don't I, don't I get any benefits or is it just the people in the future that matter, right? Not the people right now. And so that, that's actually a good idea. So I was, that's why I like talking this stuff out. 
because I hate that. Right. And I know probably most of you do too. Like, it's like, Oh, you'll get like a super cheap bundle. If you sign up with this service today. And it's like, well, shouldn't I get the cheap bundle? I've been paying you for 10 years. No, no, no. You're the sucker. You're the sucker that's been here for a while. So too bad for you. So think about that in the context of our students. Those, those students actually don't care what you're going to do 10 years from now, because they're going to be long gone. But I do think 10 year plans are important. And what I mean by that, we have to reframe what we think when we talk about a 10 year plan. The 10 year plan that I'm thinking about right now, and this kind of just hit me, you know, as I was like getting ready and uh, doing my hair, stuff like that this morning. The 10 year plan that we have to think about is what are we doing for our students today that will prepare them and what will it do 10 years for them now? And really kind of how does this impact the practice that we're doing right now? How does that actually um, think about this? And this is why I've always talked about the notion of engagement and moving to empowerment. And I used to say engagement versus empowerment. And I don't believe in that because I think it's a progression. And the thing I always say is that if you're engaged, it doesn't mean you're empowered, but if you're empowered, it guarantees you're engaged. And it's like, really, how do we give our students ownership over their practice? How do they figure out their own pathway? And I'll give you an example of like a mistake in my career and, you know, kind of thinking back, cause I like to point fingers at myself, not anyone else. So you look at, uh, I look at my first year of teaching and I'll tell you, like I was not, um, I, I, the things I knew about education, I know way more now, obviously, right. As you should, as you, you know, go into education and I, but I, the kids in my class that year, they love me and they love me because I was really funny. I could tell great stories. Uh, I was very conversational. I could take really boring content and make it super fun, right. And exciting and stuff like that. And I remember, I could just remember some days these kids would just be like so enthralled and just so engaged with everything I would say. And, you know, I just, I can have that personality sometimes. Right. And thinking about that year and I was like, you know, pretty, pretty proud of like, Hey, I did pretty good as a first year teacher. And those kids went to grade five. And I remember someone coming to like Mr. Kroos, like, Oh, we miss you so much. Our teacher is like so boring. They'd like make us do work and they make us like figure stuff out on our own. And we got to like learn all these things. And I'm like thinking about this. I was like, ah, oh, like, what have I done? I have made these kids so dependent on me being funny and telling little stories and things like that, which I'm not saying you shouldn't do, but they became so dependent upon that, that it was just like, they could just sit back and soak in what I said, but they would actually not actually go figure out stuff on their own. And I think about sometimes our helpfulness when we overdo it can lead to a helplessness to our kids be able not to figure out their own pathway. And of course we want to like, you know, remove as many barriers for our kids as possible. I, I know I do this as a dad, but I'm very cognizant that I, you know, want to make sure um, there's obstacles that sometimes we put up in front of our kids so they learn how to deal with it. And I, I can't remember the exact thing. I remember reading it somewhere. It's like, do we prepare our, the road for the child or the child for the road? And I think that's a really powerful thing. And I remember actually um, one year I had some uh, really incredible math students in my class and this is grade nine and i would give them stuff that was being done at the grade 11 12 level and i would tell them that and i would say like hey figure this out and they're like well this is not this is not for our grade and i said i know i said figure it out though and they're like well why don't you teach them? i'm like no i'm not gonna teach you. you figure it out and they were like so frustrated and mad and upset about it and then they finally figured the stuff out way beyond you know what the curriculum was telling them I remember they were like, Mr. Gross, like we got it. This is like, and they were just so amazed by that. And they learned. And what I try to teach them is that they can figure this stuff out on their own. They can figure out their own pathway. And I think as teachers, that's something that we want to do is that 10 years from now, are we putting our kids in a situation where they're not dependent upon us, where they don't need us to clear the pathway from, because guess what? We're not going to be there for them for their whole lives. They're not going to be able to, you know, go through this. So it's like really thinking about that 10 year plan is what are we doing for our kids today that will serve them tomorrow? That's the 10 year plan that we should be focusing on is like how, what are the practices that we're doing? How does this prepare kids to not just, you know, for the real world, which I think is, you know, part of life, but also to make the real world better. And that means that they're gonna have to have ownership, not just to kind of go do stuff for other people, but to actually create their own pathway moving forward. And so I think that's, that's a 10 year plan that we should be talking about. Not like, what is this going to look like? And who cares what the kids we serve right now? Let's worry about the new customers. I think that's something is that we need to really kind of think about. And so the, the second thing I, I think about is kind of connected to this 
is really kind of thinking about how teaching is more than just content and getting kids excited about content and ideas. And sometimes we're asked to teach things that um, we as educators, let's be honest, we struggle with like, why does this kid even don't need to know this, right? A curriculum is given to you and it's hard for us to figure out, you know, the validity of it, you know, in the future right now. And again, I've been guilty of this. Like, hey, Mr. Gross, why do we need to learn this? Uh, because I said so, because it's in the curriculum, which is not really a compelling reason, but uh, I hate to say this. I think at the time, um, it was hard for me to really come up with a reason. It was like, because like, this is my job and I'm forced to do this, whether I agree with it or not. And I think I struggle with that. And I think, you know, yes, there's sometimes we got to do something compliant. I always talk about the notion of like IRS, right? I, I file my taxes with the IRS every year. I don't like doing it, but I have to, and I can't throw them a PowerPoint or a video presentation. Um, but <laughs> because they'd be like, well, what, what the heck are you doing? Right. I have to do it the way that they're doing. And so I don't mind doing that because I get to do a job I love and I'm really passionate about it. And the analogy that I use often is that when kids look at school, they do they look at as the IRS form that's done once in a while or all the time? Is this something that they continuously do? And if it's once in a while, it's not a big deal. It still sucks, but we still, you know, it's not a big deal. But if it's all the time, then yeah, of course you're gonna be disengaged. And so really kind of thinking about how do we get our passions and really, you know, when we struggle with the content, I think it's kind of seeing um, the purpose, something long-term, but also connecting it to the personal interests of the, of the students that we work with. And here's, here's an example of how um, I'm a great learner, but some of that great learning wasn't tapped into. And, you know, like we all progress, we all have things that we have to do. And I, I can't say that I was the perfect or even, you know, half perfect teacher at any point in my career. But um, years ago, I, uh, like I love music. I love music and see yeah, albums behind me, probably, you know, musicians that you maybe never heard of that I absolutely love. Um, I, I only love music, but I've always wanted to play instruments and um, I love the piano. And at some point, uh, my daughters will be learning piano probably and I'll be taking lessons with them. I can play a little bit, but I want to get better. But um, I want to learn to play the guitar. And I always struggled with um, playing the guitar not because, you know, I'd see my friends and my friends could play and like, I never wanted to play the guitar and be in a band or anything like that. I just want to be able to play so I can like kind of sing on my own, just, you know, play because I just love music. I, there's a feeling that I get. Uh, I, I, I tend to not uh, be sit in silence. I always have music on in the background because I just love it so much. And, you know, I love acoustic guitar, especially when I used to watch my friends play and I would, you know, pick it up and try it and it would like hurt my fingers and I'd be like, oh, this is terrible. And so I think a lot of times I, I couldn't, get past the suck, the, you know, being terrible at something, right? And at the beginning point. And so it was always an excuse on why I wouldn't do it. And then I remember that um, my, my, my brother Alec was getting married and uh, I was gonna be the best man. I was gonna give a speech and I was like, okay, what am I gonna do? And I wanna do something fun and stuff like that. And I remember as a little kid, uh, my sister, who's like uh, 16 years older than me, I was like probably like nine or 10 years old, I did like a beatbox at her wedding and we did a rap song. It was like, I, was, I can't imagine what that would look like. But um, yeah, so I was like, okay, like, you know, I like, you know, joking around doing music and stuff like that. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna learn to play guitar and I'm gonna sing a song on my brother's wedding. And it wasn't gonna be like a song, like all sweet and stuff like that. It was gonna be a song making fun of him, things like that. So uh, about two weeks before his wedding, I pick up a guitar. So I've never played um, at all. And, you know, I, and so, you know, I got on the internet, this is before YouTube, by the way. Um, but, and I can't even remember how I figured it out, but I started figuring some stuff out and I literally locked myself, uh, in my house over summer for two weeks until I could play that song. And I worked and worked and worked until I could play it and not only play it, but play it and sing it. And I think that if you've ever learned to play an instrument, uh, it's, you know, you're very, you concentrate on the instrument to be able to sing while playing is a whole different skill. And at least it was for me. And about two weeks later, um, I actually played and now it wasn't great. It was like, but I like talked to people like, Hey, this is something I didn't, couldn't do two, two weeks and a day ago. And so good luck with how this is going to go. I played it. It was just, there was an exhilaration of playing something, making people laugh, the music and stuff like that. And so I, I was willing to get past the suck because I saw something in the future that I wanted to do. And I like kind of was driven toward that. And that's something that really 
drove me is being able to play the music that I wanted to play, to sing the songs that I wanted to sing. And really powerful with that. And then I, I thought about that experience and I thought about when I was in grade eight. And when I was in grade eight as a kid, every student had to take band. It was not a, an option, it was a requirement. So you had to take it for at least one year in my school. And so you get to pick an instrument, do whatever. And uh, I played bass guitar, which if you know anything about guitars, bass guitar and acoustic guitar um, are different. Uh, one is four strings versus six strings. And even though there's some similarities, like if you're plucking things like that, there's some things I probably picked up from bass guitar. Um, but I just picked that instrument because it was the coolest instrument that I could play, you know, and uh, I was lucky to get it. And uh, I played bass guitar and uh, the bass guitar, the, the beautiful thing about bass guitar in a band, and I don't know if every band has this, I know our band had it, is, uh, is that you have an amp. So you can easily be the loudest person, right? Like. There's no amps with the, the 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 trombones, right? So I could just crank that amp. And I remember my teacher was like, you gotta turn that down. Like you're supposed to be in the background, not the forefront, right? And I remember that distinctly. And uh, I played that and I was disruptive. I was a pain because I hated the music that we played. And it was all classical music and stuff like, and I, and I actually kind of like classical music now as I've kind of grown older. Like I'll, you know, I'm not gonna like, spend hours listening to it but like i you know I'm, I'm not like i don't i guess i don't hate it but as a kid i didn't see any value of it and i'm like so basically i'm learning this like super cool instrument i'm not learning like bon jovi or def leppard i'm learning beethoven and yeah of course there's value in that too but i didn't see that value especially as a 14 year old uh seeing this and so it was like for me there was no future that i saw myself doing something that you know i wanted to actually learn and i think part of teaching is to sometimes help kids get past the suck where they can see a future that they're interested in where they're part of that too and i think that's it's not just like how is this relevant to the world it's how is it relevant to my world how is this you know how does this actually connect where is the value in this and i know sometimes it's really hard to find that and to help students see that but like I've always said, and I always use this analogy, obviously I love basketball too. You can see the Raptors hats uh, behind me. And uh, you know, I've just, I love basketball. I absolutely love it. And uh, I would have probably read the book that Jordan Rose, which came out when I was in high school over the great Gatsby because I saw relevance to it. It was something I was interested in. It was something I you know, could have saw myself pursuing in the future. I coached ref for several years. And I think part of it is like, who are the students in front of you? What are their interests? How do we tie that content into their interests so they can get past the suck and see the future, see that value? And I think that ties into that notion of the 10 year plan. What are we doing today for kids that in 10 years now is going to actually be beneficial to them where they see this, where they get to the point, because here's what I proved when I learned that guitar, that I'm, I have the ability to learn on my own. I have the ability to do this if I see purpose and passion to it. And that's what that 10 year plan should be about. How do we get the kids today to find their own way, to find their own path, to figure it out on their own? Because that's what's really gonna be beneficial to us. So I, I see those two ideas, you know, a 10 year plan and getting past the suck is really interconnected. And so I'll probably replay this, um, you know, in my, you know, in my headphones, listen to what I just said and, you know, rethink some of the things I just said and maybe put in a blog post in the future. Maybe you'll, you'll read the blog post before you hear this too, but just know uh, neither of these blog posts have been written. But I just wanted to kind of flesh these ideas out because I just kind of like turn it on this camera, turn it on the mic and just start talking and see what comes out of my mind. But um, thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a part of this room, uh, you know, over the last little while. It, it has been such a pleasure and you might see the, the background in, the, in other podcasts, but this is the last one that I'm recording, like legitimately the last one. So we've got to give you one more. I... Uh, I appreciate all that you do. Thanks for taking the time to listen. I'll see you on a future episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Take care.